If the earth could fly away, could you see her flying straight through space and time, leaving all the humankind behind? If she could fly away, if she could fly away, so far away. If the earth could run away, could you see her gathering all the trees and plants, all the animals, all the birds and fowl, every creeping thing? They have never been her foe, never harmed her blessed soul. If she could run away, if she could run away. And she'd be running for her life, or she'd be running for her life, running for her blessed life. Battered Earth. Sweet Honey in the Rock here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're broadcasting on over 500 stations around the country, on Pacifica and NPR stations, Low Power FM, college and community radio stations. We're broadcasting on public access TV and PBS TV stations and both TV satellite networks, on Dish Network, Channel 9415, Free Speech TV, 9410, Link TV, and on Direct TV, Channel 375. And we're video and audio podcasting at democracynow.org. Our headlines are also available in Spanish at our website. Our guest today is Tim Flannery. He is known around the world as one of the leading climate change experts, leading scientists, has discovered more than 60 species, was named uh, 2007 Australian of the Year. We live in a globalized world, yet we are so insulated when it comes to getting information in this country. His name may not be as well known here. Uh, just like the International Panel on Climate Change is not as well known in the United States. Tim Flannery, let's talk more about the IPCC and what it has done over the years. How significant is it? Well, significant enough clearly to win a Nobel Peace Prize, which is exactly what they should have got. Um, that group of scientists have been working together now for over 20 years, and every five years they produce a report that really is a... Uh, a report on the, the state of our, of our planet's atmosphere and the warming that is damaging it. Um, and the, the early report started off rather mild in tone, you know, saying there might be a problem and we think it might be caused by people. The last report, the fourth assessment report, which is still being, reduced in, I'm sorry, being released in bits this year, is much more alarming. You know, the, the basic news is there, this is a human-caused problem, it's getting very severe, we need to do something about it. Uh, and it's 400 odd scientists along with some government representatives and so forth. One of the problems the, the IPCC faces is they have to do everything by consensus. It's a bit like the old Quakers, you know, how they used to have to get everyone to agree. Um, and you can imagine what it's like trying to get, for example, the representative of Saudi Arabia to agree to particular wordings of things. Um, so it, it's a long and painful process. And in my view, some of the leading scientists deserve the Order of Lenin as well as the Nobel Peace Prize because it's a very torturous business. So the IPCC um, wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, in the United States, there is this ongoing controversy over whether climate change is really an issue at all. You have corporations, the wealthiest in the world, like ExxonMobil, that has poured millions of dollars into Washington think tanks to simply raise questions about global warming. Um, they also have poured, well, over $100 million into Stanford University, part of a consortium of corporations that are funding their global climate change program there. What is this doing to the science when these corporations, BP also, now Beyond Petroleum, before called British Petroleum, uh, giving half a billion dollars to the University of California, Berkeley. Some are calling it BP Berkeley now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, it very much depends on, on um, what the expectations are. I would be comfortable with um, partnerships, for example, with BP, purely because I have a sense that that company's on the right track. It's by no means perfect but it's starting to address the fundamental problems. And they've made that great leap from seeing themselves as an oil company to seeing themselves as an energy company. And once you do that, 
you can start participating in the new industrial revolution, which is going to change our lives and clean up our planet over the next 40 years. Um, the bigger companies, ExxonMobil, for example, there is really no signs yet that that company has realised the nature of the world it's now operating in. And uh, it, it's, it's still a major problem, and particularly um, in the past decade, when you tally the cost of their uh, misleading campaigns, for example, you know, ExxonMobil and its partners in the Global Climate Coalition cost us a decade of action at least, you know. Starting with the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, those companies have been uh, frustrating progress. And as a result of that, the burden of pollution in the air causing this warming problem has grown by 20%. So that is a, a very serious issue and I believe a serious liability for those companies. In the United States, we have a situation where the Bush administration is vacuuming the words global warming off of websites. Uh, you hear the whole controversy with Gerberding uh, changing the wording to uh, soften the impact of findings that climate change is a major problem. Do you have the same problem in Australia? Well, look, our Prime Minister and George Bush were the only two leaders globally who saw fit not to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So it gives you a sense that he's hardly a left winger, this, this Prime Minister of ours. Exactly. The one who gave you Australian of the Year. He did. Although, could I just say, he presented it to me. The people of Australia really gave it to me. Um, it's, it's a, people make submissions from the public and then there's a committee process. So Do you he think was, he had a hard time doing it? I think he probably did. Um, we shall, uh, but he may have felt it was necessary. Perhaps it was a... He thought at that stage he could do something to shift public perception of his stance. But that hasn't happened. We have an election on the 24th of November, and the polls are running strongly to, to the opposition. And I think we'll have a new government uh, on the 24th of November. And their first move, they've said, is to recall Parliament and ratify the Kyoto Protocol. So then it'll be the US alone if that happens. But you, you ask about the, the, the nature of the, the White House intervention in this climate change issue. Um, for me, it's, it's perplexing, it's um, counterproductive. It, it, despite the, the orientation of our government in Australia, it's just not possible for them to do that. What they've done is cut funding to critical programs dealing with development of new energy, for example, and the monitoring of, uh, of the science of climate change. And astonishingly, this year, which is the International Polar Year, Australia, which claims a third of the Antarctic, is giving zero dollars to support research into the International Polar Year. It gives you a sense of how bad things are. Um, but we don't get this sort of uh, lying to the public where people uh, deliberately twist what their experts are saying. And I, I find that deeply disturbing. Uh, this is a democratic country. People have a right to know. And you don't because of the check and balance? That's right. It's much more difficult for our government to, to operate that way. We have a tradition of frank and fearless advice coming from the bureaucracy to government. And although that's compromised when government has a particular view, it's really impossible to eradicate uh, and to, to alter wordings uh, such as, as occurs here in this country. I think it's just it's a legacy of... Uh, perhaps the power of the White House and the structure that, 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 that scientists work within in this country, they suffer this problem. Can you talk about the problem of the feedback loop? What does that mean? Well, Earth's climate system is set up in a way that it's, it's finely balanced, so it can go along for a certain period of time in one state, and then a small impact can precipitate a whole series of changes that build on each other to rapidly shift the climate into another state. And I'd say a bit like, you know, the old analogy of a, the flap of a butterfly's wing in the Amazon causing a hurricane? That's the sort of model that you've got to think about when you think of this climate system of ours. And a, small, a relatively small input, such as human pollution into the atmosphere, can translate into a very big impact. That, that can become impossible for us to stop. We're not there yet, but we could get to that point in, in the next uh, few decades if action isn't taken. In your book, The Weathermakers, How Man is Changing the Climate and What it Means for Life on Earth, you talk about the concert of the three scenarios. What are those scenarios? Well, look, those scenarios really deal with those big positive feedback loops. You know, The first is the shutdown of the Gulf Stream, which uh, if that occurred, and uh, you know, the Gulf Stream runs along the, the U.S. East Coast and up into the North Atlantic and brings tremendous amount of warmth to Europe. We know it's shut down in the past. If it shuts down again, Europe will face a very severe conditions, uh, cold conditions, and that heat, of course, has to go somewhere that was normally going north and being dissipated. Um, my guess is it's going to go into the Gulf of Mexico and uh, the southern Atlantic and cause more severe hurricanes and so forth. Um, but, you know, we have to do more science on that to, to really justify that view. 